As you know, we're in Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. And it is not good times. It's not, it wasn't good times in uh, 1 Kings. Uh, I think he's getting it. I can, I can hear it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, it's not mine. <laughs> oh, no, I lost my place. Oh, we're, oh, Amos chapter 4, now I remember. Amos chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, Israel, that is what I will do to you. So if you hear God using that kind of language with you, it's not going to be a good day. 60 minutes waiting for you at the office, that kind of thing. <laughs> This is what I would do to you, and since, uh, and since I will do that to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. That kind of sounds like a dirty hairy, like right at the end of the gun battle, right? Prepare to meet your God. This is the end. It is over. Whatever transgression you committed, it was one too many. It was over the mark. And... You know, we don't know where the mark is because we're all dependent on grace because none of us, none of us have a 100% score. None of us are batting 1,000. None of us can say, uh, you know, when, when I was in boot camp, they had a, a, a thing called a 241 form. And if you messed up, they would, and you had to carry them in your pocket with a little flap. If you messed up, they would rip it out, sign the 241 form. You had to turn it in. You know, if you got too many of those, you got to sit back. So, I mean, none of us are, are without sin. None of us are without trespasses. And so, so there's grace, Old Testament, New Testament, there's grace, or else everybody would be zapped the moment they reached the age of accountability, right? Or, or, or soon thereafter. But apparently there is a threshold where God says, that's it. And we see it, with unbelievers, I mean, we, we saw it really with the whole earth, right? With Noah. I mean, it was the whole earth except for his family. God said, that's it. I, I regret that I created you. I regret that I made you. We see it all in the, in the Old Testament, and we see it in the New Testament. We even see it in the church with Sapphire and Ananias, who crossed the line. They lied to the Holy Spirit in church about how much they were giving, and, and God struck them dead. So God has a line. He has a threshold. And, and I, I know that there are many who want to see how close they can get without falling off the cliff, and they live their lives that way. And some people will even admit it, and they know better and they know that they're really on thin ice, but they do it anyway. And so our challenge is not to see how close to the edge we can come without falling off, but rather really just the opposite of facing God and moving toward God. I don't know how you visualize, I have to visualize things. So my image is not coming down the side of a mountain on skis going full speed and see if I can stop at the very bottom just before you go out the boundary fence and then roll down to your death. That's not my particular vision of my life on earth with God. My vision is I'm climbing the mountain. I'm going up. I'm trying to go toward him, not racing away from him. Well, Israel had been racing away from him, and God said, okay, prepare to meet your God. And if you're a person who reads English, I'm not, I'm from Texas, I don't really know much about English, but I do know what the exclamation mark stands from, so I'm not even reading it properly. Prepare to meet your God, something like that. So this is God speaking with emphasis. And so the end is near, and it's interesting to look at the last verse the end of 13, Amos chapter 4, the end of 13. And so he, he names himself in this 
pericope. Thank you, Mike. Mike's from the north. He knows English. The, the Lord, the God of armies is his name. And so people came to know God by how they experienced him. And he's saying, this is in the future. You're about to experience me. And you're going to experience me as the Lord, the God of armies. That's who I will be to you. We live in an age of grace. We live in an age where we like to think of God as love and puffy clouds and butterflies. And he made those things. And they are a great representation of part of who he is. But he also has prepared a place for those who walk away from him, those who are making conscious decisions on a daily basis to move away from him, his love, and his word. And my concern is we as a contemporary church, me as a pastor, that we have a tendency to shy away from that message is there, there are consequences. And a day will come and every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So why not make those confessions now? And why not praise him with our tongues now and be headed in the right direction, even though at times it seems like it's uphill? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for giving us your word and an opportunity tonight where we can gather together again and, uh, and talk about what you've said in the past and to prayerfully apply what that means to us in the present. And Lord, we're, we're thankful that you are the God of grace, that you are the God of love and comfort and encouragement and, and of strength and all those things that you bring to our life. But Lord, help us to be realistic and help us to be sober about the wrath that is a result of sin against you. And, and help us to be uh, right when we think about it, when we pray about it. And Lord, uh, help us, Lord, help us to share with others in a way that they can digest it and that they can process it for the sake of their own souls. We pray it together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you all. Uh, those that are here for Master Life, if you would come on up closer into these two sides right here. And those who are going to other connection groups, good to see you tonight. Hey, welcome, everybody. So I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because I don't want to embarrass anyone, but are you doing your work? Because I'm not covering what you're reading. I'm kind of doing something off to the side. I'm trying to augment it, but if you think you're going to get from me what you don't do in the book, they're, they're, they're working together. I'm not intentionally, at least, repeating the, the work that you're doing. And the work that you're doing is going to be so much more impactful than, than what I say. I'm, I, I know that to be true. And so I encourage you to do that. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, could you give me a donut? No, I'm kidding. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Harlan's here. We can start. Experiencing God, Unit 2. I was just encouraging these guys to be sure and do your work. 
that will make the difference. Last week, we talked about hearing from God. We looked in Luke chapter 5, and we talked about uh, Peter and Andrew and how Jesus got in their boat. There's a whole sermon right there, Jesus in your boat, right? I actually preached one of those about 15 years ago, Jesus in your boat. So Jesus got in their boat, and he asked them to do something that didn't make sense to them. Do you remember the story? If you were here last week, did it make sense? He told them to go, go out a little deeper and cast out your net. And they were like, been doing this all night. Hasn't been effective. Nevertheless, what? At thy word. At thy word. At thy word. And that, that's a little phrase that if we would really take it to heart and have that attitude... Uh, then we could do what Peter eventually did at the end of that story. What are the three things that we, that we know when, when God is speaking to us? Number one, we know it's God speaking, right? We're clear. This is God speaking. And, and I, I was counseling with a, a young man this afternoon, and he's in a difficult situation, and was, we're praying for God to intervene, and, and he said, how will I know if it's God? And so being a deep, deep theologian as I am, I said, you will know, right? You will know. And so number one, they knew it was God. Number two, this is in your, in your homework too. They knew what he was saying. They knew it was God speaking. They knew exactly what he was saying. And what's the third one? They knew how to respond in obedience. They knew what the proper response was in order to be obedient to what he had said. And then, of course, that's the key. Do we respond to what we just heard God said? Uh, Henry Blackaby used an example years ago. I was at a conference, and he was talking about um, a young man who came up to talk to him much like I did in 1992, went up to talk to Henry Blackaby about whether or not we should move here. It's an interesting story. He said, do you want to do it God's way? Or you want to do it man's way? And I'm like, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I need to hear. Uh, but this young man came up to him and said, I'm confident that God has called me to the mission field, to be a missionary. But my fiance doesn't want to go. What should I do? He said something like, marry a different woman. <laughs> did, did God call you to the mission field or not? If he called you to the mission field, then that's, that's your call. I thought it was, I thought it was a, little, a little harsh, but accurate. You know, because if God calls you to a mission field, he calls your wife or he calls your spouse to the mission field. He actually calls your kids to the mission field, if that's what God is calling you to do. Moses took wife and kids, at least the first part of the trip. Okay, so we talked about hearing from God. We talked about uh, believing God in a crisis, and we were looking at Mark chapter 4, where Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake. You remember that story? Let's go to the other side of the lake. They got in the boat, and the storm came. Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. What's the back of the boat called? Stern. Thank you, Ted. Uh, and so he was asleep in the stern on a cushion. The scripture is very specific. He was laying his head on the cushion. And, uh, and then they determined that they were going to sink because water, the, the boat was taking on water. And so they, um, they said to, they woke him up and basically made an accusation. Don't you care that we're going to die? Because that's the only conclusion, a logical conclusion they could come to based on their circumstances. We talked about how we make what we believe are accurate, uh, 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 we make an accurate analysis of the situation based on the facts as we know them, and then we project that on God. And sometimes we say, God, you, you don't even seem to care. You know, I thought you were a loving God. You're not doing what seems logical, like this is your responsibility. And, uh, and, and so the problem with reaching, taking those uh, experiences and their train of thought and their logic and saying the truth of the situation is we're about to die, 
and we conclude from that that you don't care, when the fact that the truth was what? You guys were here last week, right? Asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, was asleep in the back of the boat. That was the truth, and what had Jesus said was going to happen? We're going to the other side of the lake. He didn't say, we're going to the bottom of the lake, we're going to die, we're going to drown, somebody's going to watch it. He didn't say any of that. He said, we're going to the other side of the lake. And, and, and so it's important that when we hear from God, that we actually believe what he says. Because what if we don't believe what he says? We're not going to respond in obedience, especially when the heat gets turned up. We will bail. Alinda and I felt called to, for me to be a senior pastor. And we were in our little hometown, and God had already removed the one obstacle, which was our dream home. And he sent the tornado, and he got it out of the way. And said, okay, I've solved that problem. Now you can move, right? And so we were praying what to do. And it's, it's astonishing, I know, for you to hear this. But no one called me and said, we want you to be our pastor. No one called It hurt my feelings, kind of. This went on for months and months and months. So now we're like, okay, now what are we supposed to do? By that time, I had resigned. I was a youth pastor because I was so confident that now was the time I actually resigned. And, um, and in our little hometown, uh, on the corner, right across from the bank, nice location, there was a, a Bible bookstore and uh, a teacher supply, half and half. Well... I was a pastor, Bible bookstore. She was a teacher, teacher supply, hometown. And this couple that we knew from church were ready. They were like done. And they're like, we're, you know, we're, we would practically give it to you. I mean, we'll, we'll say all the, of course, the goodwill of the business, and they had a lot of goodwill in town. We'll say the inventory and even the building. I think it was like $78,000 or something, which, you know, was a lot at the time. But it was like a gift. And we were so tempted to do that. But then we had to step back and say, did God call me to be a lead pastor? Well, the answer was yes. So why are we buying a bookstore? So what we believe about God, what we know he said to us, and then, and then how we respond, whether it's pressure, like a crisis, like they were, thought they were going to drown, or it's temptation to, to a, a, a deal too good to pass up, what we believe about God and what God has said to us is, is critical. All right, so today we're going to go through the seven steps that we're going to think through, the seven steps. You have it in the back of your book, on the inside cover, in the back of your book. And uh, I'd like to get a little participation you have the, the mic. Anybody on here want to be the mic person? Uh, each time you use it, I think you'll have to turn it on. Is it off now? Okay. So what I'd like to have you do is somebody volunteer. Mike will come to you. You will read, like, number one, and then you will give your thoughts. And this is not like you're being graded. Just give your thoughts what that means to you. When you read that statement, what do you, what do you think that means? Okay. Number one, who would like to be the brave person? Do number one. Since John Mark has the mic, he's number one. Go, John. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. All right, so inside the back cover, am I right on that? Yeah, there it is. Inside the back cover, there's the diagram. Number one, God's work. Anybody? Okay, uh, Mike, right here. Isaiah? Thank you, Jen. God is always at work around you. Um, what does that mean to, me? to you? When, when, so what, yeah, what does that mean? From the beginning, from the fall of man, when he gave the curse and he told the enemy, you know, that your bruises heal, but he'll crush your head. So God had a redemption plan from the beginning. So he was always at work from Genesis all the way through Revelation, that was his plan, and he's inviting us into that plan. Good, good. It, it is. Uh, 
we can't turn it up too much because of the feedback. Can you guys hear it in the back? Can you hear it, Luke, a little bit? Okay, come up front. <laughs> Trick question. Uh, maybe if I scoot back a little bit. Junior, you want to see if we can turn it up a little? Let me turn it a little away from me. Crank it up and see what it does. Testing one, two. Test one, two, three. That's better, right? Okay, I think we're good if I don't walk in that direction. Okay, so God is always at work. So Virginia pointed out that, yeah, I mean, through the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, God's always at work. Does anyone, anyone know what a deist is? A deist, I'll just say it. A deist is a person who believes that there is a creator God, but he kind of moved on, you know, with other, other places, with other interests. It's not that he doesn't see what's going on or know what's going on. He's just not involved in what's going on. Um, that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is personally involved. The God of the Bible has a mission, and he is working for the redemption of mankind. God is on mission to save us from ourselves. He made us for a loving relationship with himself, and he's working to give us that opportunity instead of being separated from him by our sins because God is pure, and we are not. That's the, that's the problem of humanity. We are not pure, but to have a loving relationship with God, we must be pure. So that's the real problem. How does an impure person become pure with God? That's our dilemma. We, we can't fix that. And so we're totally dependent upon God to, to intervene on our behalf, which is why Jesus came to take our sins up on himself. And with that came the wrath of God that would have been against us is now laid on Jesus on the cross. And that's the reason they mocked him and cursed him and whipped him and killed him. And spiritually, it pleased God that Jesus demonstrated his love by taking the wrath that we could not handle in eternity upon himself and paid for it. And so it was demolished on the cross, as was Jesus' physical life. But that didn't deter God. He brought him back to life. The sins didn't come back to life. They were done. But the Son of God came back to life and was resurrected. And so God is at work redeeming mankind, and he continues, to your point, he continues to this day and will to the very end in that we're not standing at the foot of the cross observing this and processing it and embracing what Christ did in, on that day for those who were standing there and who saw it. In a sense, we don't have that advantage to be so impacted by his torture and his death for us, or even his wonderful life and ministry before that, we're so much after the fact, but what we do have is the recording of his word. We have the example of the apostles and of the early church fathers and of those who were martyred for the faith and those who have been scholars and those who have been missionaries for two thousand years. We have that testimony. So we have God's word. We have the life and the testimony of the saints. And above that, I say above that, in addition to that, we have the Holy Spirit of God bringing that to bear. You remember in Luke chapter 24, it says that when Je the resurrected Jesus was walking to the two, with the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, that after he disappeared, that they went back to Jerusalem and they realized that he had opened their minds to understand the scripture. Truth is not 
discovered. Truth is revealed. Think about that statement for a minute. Truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed. And those of us who want to know God at a deeper level become hungry for in our relationship with him and hungry for a deeper level of understanding about the truth of who he is. And so there's this building relationship that over time he gives us more truth. In the biblical concept that an older person, an elder, should be wiser. Why? They've been walking with him a long time. And as that relationship has gotten stronger and stronger, that he shares more insight with them, right? And they re he reveals the deeper level of truth. We will never plumb the depths of God's word. We'll try, and rightly so. Uh, I, I used a, a, a quote that was from, I can't remember who it was from. I think it might have been Warren Wiersbe. But he, he had this quote, I think I used it a couple Sundays ago, that wanting more, the, the Bible needs extra biblical material added to it about like the Sahara Desert needs more sand. God has revealed everything we need for life and godliness in his word. And what his word is communicating is that God is continually at work. God is a worker, Jesus is a worker, therefore we are workers. Okay, so that's the first one. Second one, relationship. Volunteer, come on, let's do it. Woo, woo, woo. There we go. Thank you, Miss Loretta. I look at uh, relationships as me and my husband. I love my husband, and um, I want to spend time with him, and I think that God's want us to spend time with him and in his word so we can come to know him because he speaks to us through his word and that's how we build a relationship with him by spending time with him right. because we love him. That's good. That's a good analogy. So God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. To, to your point, Miss Loretta, if, uh, if you didn't ever want to be around John and you lived in separate houses and you never called each other, I mean, it would seem like it wasn't real and personal love relationship. That's what it would seem like, right? I mean, that's just normal. And so God is not, again, he's not a deist. He's not moved on. He has other interests. And it's not he's not just observing, but he's intimately involved in what's happening here on earth and especially in the life of believers. And so God's at work. He's, he's moving, he's on mission, and he wants to build and have a relationship with us, which is why he created mankind to begin with, was to have a loving relationship with us. And so that, that's a given. That is the heart of God. And so obviously through Christ, we establish that relationship, and I've talked about this for the last two weeks, so our, relation, our, our loving relationship with God, once we accept Christ as our Savior, is immediate. And we are ushered into the throne room and right up to the Father immediately as children with their Father. We go past the guards. We go past the counselors, you know, past the jesters. You know, we, we come right up to the Father and we are fully welcomed and accepted. So he's building this relationship with us. Now, as that trust relationship grows, then we have the opportunity. Oh, I actually wanted to share a couple of passages. I think this is what you guys have been studying, right? In Exodus chapters two and three about Moses. So in Exodus chapter two, God is always at work around you. Exodus chapter two, verse 23 after a long time, the king of Egypt died, the one that, that knew, um, just went blank, Joseph. Joseph? The one that knew Joseph. And so they were in good graces with Pharaoh because of Joseph's service. So he, but 
that they died. And so the Israelites were thrown into slavery and they groaned because of their difficult labor and slavery and they cried out and their cry for help because of the difficult labor. Uh, they, uh, try it again. And their cry for help because of the difficult labor, their cry for help ascended to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob, which by the way, was it had been over 400 years and since they had actually left the uh, land of Canaan and gone into Egypt. Uh, But God remembered his promise to them. And so God is on mission and God has a very specific plan and it included the children of Israel. And now they are down in Egypt and they are crying out to God. Verse 25, God saw the Israelites and God knew. Are you guys looking at Exodus 2, 25? Exodus 2, 25. God saw the Israelites and God knew. Now, there's a whole sermon right there. God knows where you are. He knows where you are physically. He knows where you are financially, relationally, vocationally. He knows where you are spiritually. God knows exactly where you are. He is a personal God who is at work, and he has a mission and a goal. And his mission wasn't about Moses. His mission was about redeeming mankind, and he was going to start that through his children, the children of Israel. And he knew where they were. And so then we jump to Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. God pursues a continuing love relationship that is real and personal. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, literally back at the sheep ranch, meanwhile, back at the ranch, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. And so God is at work. He's on mission. He's redeeming mankind. Doesn't have anything to do with Moses per se. It's about what God is doing. But meanwhile, there's Moses literally out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is a desert. It is dry. It is exactly as you would imagine it. It is parched and dry, and barren. That's the reason he had to take those sheep so far south, because they're just getting what little grass or scrub they can. They just have to keep moving, keep moving, because there's not much there. So he's out in the middle of nowhere, minding his own business, just tending sheep. He's been doing this for 40 years, right? He's just tending these sheep, and suddenly God is appearing to him, not primarily about him, but about what he's doing with the children of Israel in redeeming mankind. Now, I'd like for you to watch unit two of the video. You guys have the information in the next to the last page in your workbooks about how to access that. And there's your code right in the middle of that page. Page what? I don't know if it has a page number. It doesn't have a page number. It's the flap inside the back flap, whatever that's called. And, and so, um, so I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so continue relationship, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. So now I regain my train of thought. So we have a tendency to ask, what is God's will for me? That's, that's typical. That's typical among Christians, Right? What is God's will for me? Which the problem with that, and so this is what this video does an excellent job of explaining. When you want to understand the universe and you start with yourself as the center of the universe, you already have a false premise because you're not the center of the universe, right? You're asking the wrong question. Although it's, it's typical, it's common. What is God's will for me? right? But it's not about me. 
And that's hard for us to digest, especially as Americans. Not about me? Seriously? Well, okay. Well, who's it about? About God. And God in eternity and what he's doing and what his mission is. And so I'm insignificant. I'm only significant because God says I'm significant. Not because in and of myself I'm so wonderful or so great, but God says I'm significant because he created me, he created you in his image for a love relationship with him. And so whatever significance we have is what he attributes to us. And whatever is happening that is significant is what he's doing. And so the best and highest thing that could ever happen is for me to realize what his will is. Not what his will is for me, as if the universe is focused on me, and it's not, but what is he focused on? Well, all the people, all the past, all the present, all the future, he's focused on everybody, and he's going about the redemptive mission. And so if I can get a grasp of what his will is, the moment I understand that, And the moment I see him at work, that is my invitation to join him in what he's doing. So I guess you could say it like this. God's will for me is to understand his will and join him, right? Does that make sense? So that's the relationship. And the third one is, who would like to read that and and give a word about it? Actually, I'm falling behind. Okay, I'm going to plow ahead. So God invites you to become involved with him in his work. Amos chapter 3, verse 7 says this, Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. God communicates to us as his people what he's doing. And there's a lot of believers that are surprised that he's actually communicating to us because they're not getting it. They're not hearing it. They're not seeing it. But typically, those who are not hearing and getting or seeing it also don't have a disciplined quiet time. And they're not reading God's Word systematically. They're not studying it. And they're, they're not praying over and above telling God what they want Him to do or what they'd like for Him to do. They're, they're speaking and not listening because God is communicating. God is speaking. He is showing us. If we have spiritual eyes, we can recognize what he's doing. We're learning the pattern from Scripture of how God communicates with people. And so when we get an understanding of that pattern as we study Scripture, then when we see that pattern playing out in front of us, we can confidently say, God is at work. You know, what if suddenly at the high school across the way, a hundred kids got saved in a week? Hello, is God at work? Mightily, mightily at work. Well, we recognize that, right? We can recognize that from his word. Uh, the day of Pentecost, well, there's, I think it's 3,000 something, two or 3,000 kids across 3,000 kids. Well, they all got saved in one day. Is God at work? That's the day of Pentecost. So, so we understand the pattern, but when we see it, when we have spiritualized enough, when we're mature enough that we see it and we can connect the dots, that is our invitation to join him. And so if all 3,000 kids got saved, would we go offer up our services of ministry, of discipleship? We would be joining God at work, right? Okay, so he invites us to join with him. So with Moses, Exodus 3, 7, then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their suffering, and I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so God is rescuing. Verse 10, he says to Moses, therefore, he says, this is my will. This is what I'm doing. Therefore, what is your part? Therefore, Moses, go. I am sending you. So what is God's will for Moses' life? It's to join God in what he's doing. God said, this is what I'm doing. Therefore, 
You, this is your part. I'm sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Fourth point, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, the prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. God speaks through his word. So Stephen, Philip, Philip and the eunuch. So in Acts, Philip uh, is lifted by the Holy Spirit and he sees the eunuch driving in the chariot and he approaches him and says, you know, what are you reading? He says, I'm, I'm reading in the book of Isaiah. And he's like, do you understand it? And he said, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? And the scripture says, and he started at that same verse and preached to him the gospel. I'm paraphrasing a little. Well, what if he had been reading in Exodus? What if he had been reading in Genesis? You can start anywhere in the Bible and preach Jesus. Anywhere. It's all God's word. It all leads to, to the cross. It all leads to the resurrection. And so God speaks to us through the Bible. Now, we've got to be careful that we, there's a difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is you're drawing out what God is saying. Eisegesis is you're reading in what you wanted to say. Right? And that's a temptation that we all have. So especially when you're seeking God's will in a particular matter, there's a temptation to say, well, I'll tell you what that says to me. I'm supposed to buy that car. That's what I get out of that. You know, I have to be careful. What, it, what is God saying? And you don't just... You don't just do a reading of the Word. You couple that with your prayer life. And so, so let's say I sense that God is speaking something to my heart. I get on my knees and I say, this is me. God, I just want to be honest. I want the car. Let's just get that on the table and let's just be honest in this conversation. I want the car and I think I can make it happen. Having said that, What's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? God, if it's possible, I don't want to go to the cross. And in, in essence, what he was saying, if, if this is, I'm just, I'm just saying, God, I'm saying, Father, it's possible. I just want, to, want you to know what I'm struggling with and what I'm feeling. If it's possible, I don't want to go to the cross. And then what did he say? Not my will, but yours. The biggest obstacle is coming to that place where we are willing to say, not my will, but yours. Nevertheless, at thy word. Same thing, really, right? Nevertheless, what, whatever you say. The, the biggest obstacle is to get our spirit and our emotions in a place that is neutral about whatever we're praying about. I'm not trying to manipulate you, God. I'm not trying to give you a sales job. I've been honest about what I'm thinking and feeling, what I think I see. That's on the table. But having said that, Lord, please give me guidance because I want to know your will and I want to follow your will. That's hard to do, but it's essential. And so we read in God's word. We sense when he's speaking to us. We take it to him in prayer. And I've, I've heard this advice. George Mueller, who was a, a great Christian scholar 150 years ago in Bristol, England, he used to say it this way. Take it to the Lord in prayer that morning, that night, and again the next morning. I think that's good advice. Because if, if a depression, if a weather depression comes across, it changes our mood, right? And so maybe we just prayed one time and we were, in a, we were not in a good place at that moment. So, so give yourself some time. Sleep on it. Pray about it. Now, I'm not saying take a week so that your delay becomes disobedience, but give yourself the confidence that this is what God is saying. So the first one is what does God's word say? The second one is prayer. The third one is circumstances. Now, our tendency is to only go with circumstances. Like, I don't need to read it in the Bible. I don't need to pray about it. They're offering me $50,000 more a year. I know I have to move to Minot, North Dakota, but it's obviously God's will, right? Uh, Greenland, Greenland, sorry. 
So it's obviously God's will because they offered me $50,000 more a year. I don't, I don't need to pray about it. Yes, yeah, I'll load up the family, we're going. That's our Achilles heel as Americans. We are independent, we are on the move, and we just go, give me, give me the facts and I'm out, right? And we, it could be the worst, excuse me, the worst decision of our lives. So read God's word, listen for God's voice, pray, read, pray, read, pray. See that those are lining up and line up in your spirit. Now you guys have prayed or you had a situation and you felt anxious about it, am I right? You can feel anxiety about a situation. Take that as a sign from God that you haven't prayed through it enough yet. So it's, it's, a, it's a red light, it's, it's a red flag, it's an indicator because God can give you peace in turmoil. Jesus said that right, right there in John chapter 14, my peace I give to you, right? So he can give you peace in turmoil, but he also can give you anxiety in what appears to be a good decision. So everything looks right, everything adds up, even feels good in my emotions, but I've got this in my spirit. We used to call it a check in your spirit. You ever heard that term? I just had a check in my spirit. My mom says, when in doubt, leave it out, right? So, so pay attention to what's going on in your spirit as you're reading God's word and as you're praying. And then circumstances, and we talked about, I think the last couple of weeks, an open door is not a big equal sign to God's will. What appears to be an open door is not in and of itself a big equal sign to God's will. But circumstances are one of the indicators. Now, the thing about these four indicators is you, you're not looking for, for a majority. You're not looking for half of them to line up and the other half, whatever. I don't have time to, I don't have time to wait. I got to make a decision. You're not looking for 75%, three out of four to line up. You're looking for all four to line up. This is what I honestly sense God said to me through John chapter 14. I've been praying about it. I've been honest about what I'd like to happen. I'm doing my very best through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be neutral and to say to God, not my will, but thine. I get up off my knees, I'm watching the circumstances to see where God may be at work. And so the next morning, a guy comes up to me and starts a conversation about this very issue. Happens to be the strongest Christian in my company. And he comes up and starts the conversation. And he starts giving me wise counsel. Coincidence? It's one of the four indicators. And the fourth one is that wise counsel typically from your church family, but it can be a mature Christian who's not necessarily a member of, of your church, wise counsel. Because we can come up with all kinds of crazy things, am I right? And a mature Christian who doesn't really have any skin in the game, but cares about you, you know, will probably ask you some questions. Well, you know, what, what are you getting from the Word? What's going on in your spirit as you pray about it? What, what are the circumstances that you're seeing? Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. Let's have a cup of coffee. And they're, they're helping you, right? They're helping you process. They're asking questions that you didn't dare ask yourself, right? Well, what about this? What, what does your wife say? You know, or your husband? What, what are they sensing? Are they sensing the same thing from God or is it very different? Because if God's going to speak to your family, and your wife is a believer, or your husband is a believer, don't you think he can speak into their life as well? It's not just that you pressure them and tell them, God said, therefore we go, or we do this, or we do that. Isn't God able to speak to everyone in the family who's honestly seeking him? And, and so the, a wise counselor will ask you those kinds of questions and help you I mean, they're going to try to force you or talk you out of it necessarily, but they're going, to, they're going to ask questions and get you thinking about it and talking about it and processing. Because, here's why. When you're confident God has spoken, you're going to drive 
down that permanent stake, which will be a marker in your spiritual life for the rest of your life. Because it, whatever the decision is could be life-changing. If God is speaking to you, it is life-changing. And so you, you have to know. So Moses had the burning bush. He drives down the stake. God spoke. God sent me there. He gets there, and Pharaoh goes, let them go. Absolutely. It's obvious from God. What was his name? I am? Yeah. Take them and go. And take gold and take silver and take horses and chariots. We love you. Just whatever we can do to help. We'll defend you until you get there. I'll send soldiers around. The... No, he said, what did he say? Get out. Get, get out. How many times did he say that? Ten times. All right, where's the open door? It doesn't appear. So each time, Moses has to go back and say, did God speak to me? Did I drive down the stake? Is this really what God said? Because if God said it, then it doesn't matter what kind of greeting or what kind of what I thought would be an, an easy uh, approach to this. It could be the hardest thing you've ever experienced. But if you know God spoke, if you know that's an assignment from him, you can stand. And so that's the reason we're taking our time studying the Bible. We're taking our time praying, and we're asking wise counsel, and we're trying to, to discern the circumstances because it could be life-changing. It's God speaking to us. When we moved here, as you can see, changed our lives for probably the rest of our lives. So it was huge to know, is this God? All right, the next one is God gives you the invitation, which he did here with Moses, to work with him, and he always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. So we talked about this. This is who you are. This is your skill set. This is what you can do. This is what God calls you to do. Will God ever call you to do something that's beyond your ability to accomplish? Always, always. This is a God-sized assignment. This is you doing a good thing. There's nothing wrong with doing a good thing. But when God gives us an assignment, it puts us in a crisis because a God-sized assignment ends up with God getting the glory. And if you do something you can do, people say, you're very talented, you're a hard worker, so you, it's great you did that, but it doesn't make me believe in God because you did that. But they know that this is your cap and this is your level, and God through you did this. This is a testimony for God. In fact, you will be testimony, testimony, test, testifying just like with Moses standing on the edge of the Red Sea, what's he going to do? <laughs> he raised up staff, and it parted. He goes, that's God. And, we, and everybody said, yeah, we have no doubt that you didn't do that. That's a God thing, right? And then they went through on the dry sea. So, so a, a God assignment is a God-sized assignment, and it will always require faith. Because the, the difference between what you can do and what God has called you to do, there's a gap which causes stress and a crisis in your belief. And at that point, you have to apply faith. If God's asked you to do this, it doesn't really take any faith. You just go do it. But if he asks you to do this, you've got to have faith. Not faith in yourself. Faith in God. You see that? And what we do at the point of a crisis of belief says more about what we believe about God, not what we believe about ourselves. So Moses says a crisis of belief, he says, I can't speak well. I, I can't do this. I can't do that. And, and God says, well, I know. It doesn't really matter if you're here or here. God was saying, Moses said, you think I'm here. I'm not here. I'm like here. He goes, it doesn't matter. You, you're not here. That's the issue. I'm going to take care of all that. And what did God say? He said, I will be with you. This is the assignment I'm giving you, and you trust me and follow me. I will be with you. So what is the promise of the Holy Spirit? 
who will always be with us, never leave us, never forsake us. What does heaven look like in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation? And he will be with us, and he will be our God, and we will be his people. That's all relationship, all the way back to the beginning. Still all about the relationship. And so we will have a crisis of belief. The question is, will we respond properly? Will we respond with obedience? Saying goes like this You can't stay where you are and go with God. The two are mutually exclusive. Moses could not continue to shepherd the sheep at Mount Horeb in Milan and go to Egypt and bring the people back. He couldn't do both. He had to make a choice, he had to make a major adjustment in his life. And when God calls you out of your comfort level, and you don't operate here, you operate here, right? You're not totally maxed out every day. You're you're operating in your comfort zone down here somewhere, which is fine, until God gives you this assignment. And then you're like, not only do I have to max out, so to speak, I have to be like totally dependent on God. And so you have to decide And this is your opportunity to respond in faith. You have to decide, what do you believe about God? Did he really speak it into my life? Do I believe that he can do it and will do it if I follow in obedience? And if the answer to those questions are yes, then you have to, excuse me, make adjustments. Sometimes that will be geographical. Sometimes it may be educational. Uh, If he's called you to be a missionary, a medical missionary, and you haven't been to medical school, what's the first major adjustment you've got to make? Go to medical school. I mean, whatever he's calling you to do, you have to adjust your life to, to do that. And then the last one, you come to know God by experience as you obey him and he accomplishes his work through you. Have you guys ever seen the list of the different names of God from the Bible? You guys have seen those, right? Elohim and, you know, Raphael. Uh, So the different names. But they came, those names came by how the people experienced God. Let me give you an example. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 10, this is... uh, Abraham's, um, Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, who, uh, you know the story. So anyway, Sarah wasn't treating her well, and she ran away. Verse 10, the angel of the Lord said to her, appeared to her out in the desert, I will greatly multiply your offspring, and they will be too many to count, which was a huge blessing in the ancient day, that, that you had many kids. The angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived by Abraham and will have a son and his name will be Ishmael for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. Down to verse 13. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, you are in El Rorai. For she said, in this place have I actually seen the one who sees me. So she's out in the desert, she's running away, she's got no prospects of where she's gonna go, or what she's gonna do, she's desperate. And it turns out she's actually pregnant. And so the angel comes to her and speaks to her, and God speaks to her through the angel and said, this is your future, and it's a great future. And so her response was, the Lord sees me. Back to what we said before, the Lord knows where I am. The Lord sees me, and now, Because I'm aware of that, I see him. And though she gave him a name which said, the Lord sees me. And so they would give God these names based on the fact that they had experienced God because now they knew God in that way. If God was a healer or if God was a rescuer or if God was a victor, whatever they experienced God, they now knew him powerfully in that way. And they knew God by that name. 
So how do we get to a place where we've experienced God in such a powerful way? Right here. Now, this, this again, this is not a formula. This is the pattern we see in Scripture, which is helpful and instructive to us as we seek to see God and know God through Scripture. God's at work. It's what we know about him. He's seeking a loving relationship with us. He invites us to join him in that work. He speaks to us through his word, through prayer, through circumstances, and through wise counsel. And when all four of those things line up and God is saying the same thing to us through all four things, which includes his peace in our spirit through prayer, now we have a crisis of belief because he's given us a God-sized judgment uh, assignment which is bigger than what we can do. And if we believe him, we know he spoke to us and we believe him, then we have to be willing to make whatever adjustments in our life that takes. And if we do, we will, ex- we will obey God and experience him in a powerful way that we would have never experienced him without obeying him and hearing from him and following. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to rehearse who you are and what you've done with others in the past. And Lord, help us to recognize this pattern in our own lives, that we can see how you're working and how you're moving and how you're speaking to us and inviting us to be involved with you on your mission. Lord, help each person as we apply this in the coming days. Lord, help us with uh, the daily work that we do and help us to gain insight uh, each time we open your word. We pray it together in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Hopefully, everybody signed up. So there's three of these floating around. You only have to sign one or check the box if your name's already on it.